Hello everyone and welcome to today's review of experimental design. This video is geared mostly towards AP Biology students who are preparing to take the AP Bio exam and need to be able to know how to answer some experimental design questions for the test, but it could be a good review for you if you're just studying biology at the college or upper high school level and you want to get to know some basics about experimental design. Let's get started. So if you're taking the AP Bio exam, there will be some specific experimental design questions on the exam and at the end of the video I'll go through exactly when those will probably show up for you on the exam. The College Board is fortunately very specific with what it's going to ask when on the test. So you can be prepared for it mentally and know when it's coming on the exam. Right off the bat, being able to design an experiment and identify variables and controls and create hypotheses, these are all scientific skills that you're going to need to know to be successful in AP Bio exam. And first and foremost, you should know what your independent variable is or your IV. This is what you're actually testing in the experiment. This is what I tell my students I, the experimenter, am changing, so think I, V, independent variable, I, the experimenter. So if I have a bunch of different groups, what I'm changing in each group is the independent variable. So let's say, really basic experiment, I'm testing how different colors of light affect plant growth. What I am changing here in this experiment is the colors of light on each plant or each plant group. That's the IV, the independent variable. If we were to state this in an experimental title, we would say the effect of light color on plant growth. So the effect of light color, that gives us a hint towards the independent variable. Now, of course, in the AP Bio exam, you're going to see experiments that are way more complicated than this and use complex terms and, and names of weird proteins that you've never even heard of before. So a good way to tell what the independent variable is in the experiment is to look in your data table or your results and see what all the different groups are that are going to be compared to each other. That should give you a very clear indication of what the independent variable is. So for example, there could be scientists testing the presence or absence of a particular toxin, the presence or absence of something like caffeine or another chemical. But let's compare this to the DV or the dependent variable in the experiment. This is where you're getting your data from. So think D for dependent variable, D for data. If there's numbers in an experiment of the data you're collecting, this should be really easy to identify. If we go back to our really simple plant growth experiment, we're going to see the DV is what we're measuring to collect our results. So in this case, it could probably be plant height in centimeters, whatever value you're going to measure with. And those numbers could be recorded day by day. So plant height, that's our dependent variable in the experiment. Go back to the statement of the experiment. The effect of light color on plant growth, plant growth measured in height, that is our dependent variable. Very frequently on the AP Bio exam, you will be asked to identify the dependent variable in the experiment. And all you have to state is what is being measured or the data that's being collected. Again, this probably isn't going to be a simple value like height in centimeters, but look again at your data table and see what those values are at different time points or at the end of the experiment. Maybe it's the amount of light emitted. Maybe it is the production of a certain protein or enzyme activity level. Whatever it is in your data table, the values are, that are being recorded from the experiment, that's your dependent variable, what's being measured. Now let's get into controls. So I like to split controls into two different things. There's a control group in the experiment, or possibly a negative control in the experiment. And then there are controlled variables or controlled factors that you're going to want to control for in your experiment. So that was control a lot of times. What does that mean? Well, in general, to have a controlled experiment, you want to eliminate all the other confounding variables or things that might affect the results of your experiment that are not the independent variable. So if you're not testing temperature in our plant growth experiment, you want to make sure all the plants are grown at the same temperature. At the same time of day, you're collecting the results. You want to make sure they have the same humidity levels, the same soil, the same water amounts. These are controls or environmental factors that you want to keep the same in your experiment. Now, a control group is something to compare your results against. This is going to ensure that the observed results or the data you're collecting, your dependent variable, are going to be a result of the independent variable and not other differences in the environment. Often, if there's a genetic experiment, you might have a mutant group and then a wild type or normal group without the mutation. That wild type group is going to be your control group so you can compare the effects of the mutation against the control group. If you think about a negative control, think about it as the group that does not contain your independent variable, the thing that you're testing. So in our plant experiment, again, we could say our negative control would be the plant group that doesn't have a different color light. Maybe it's just exposed to normal white light or daylight instead of the colored filters that we put on all of the other plants. 
as our changing independent variable. Remember, this is to see if your independent variable actually causes a difference compared to when there's not a difference. And on the AP Biology exam, you will be asked to generate a hypothesis or predict results. Frequently, you'll be asked to create a null hypothesis. Now, a null hypothesis may seem a little backwards in your brain, but it's really useful in statistical testing. And if you need to see more of that, you can check out my chi-square video for chi-square analysis. But just creating a null hypothesis up front is like stating there will be no change or no observed effect of the independent variable in the experiment. So what does that look like? It's gonna be that things are the same as each other, so that the effects of the independent variable are gonna be the same as the control group. There's not gonna be any major difference between your conditions. So in statistics, if you reject the null hypothesis, then the alternative hypothesis, something that says there will be a change, could be considered or accepted. So we could state taking a vitamin B supplement will have no effect on fingernail growth. Tomato plants do not exhibit a higher rate of growth when planted in compost rather than soil. Or dogs fed X brand of dog food exhibit no significant weight gain in comparison to dogs fed their usual brand of dog food. Let's take a look at a few more. In genetic experiments, the null hypothesis is gonna be something like this. The data are consistent with the predicted method of inheritance. You're gonna state that there's gonna be no change from what the probabilities are of a particular cross or the theoretical expectation. You could also state something like this in a different experiment. Temperature has no effect on the level of protein production. There will be no difference in the embryo survival rates at different carbon dioxide levels. So you're seeing this repetition of no effect, no difference. That's what you're gonna go for in your null hypothesis. Then in an alternative hypothesis, you are gonna say that there will be an effect of the independent variable. So you could state there will be a decreased survival rate in embryos at higher CO2 levels. That's an alternative hypothesis for this same experiment. Okay, so when are you gonna have to do all these things? On the AP Biology exam, experimental design could come up in your multiple choice questions or in different parts of FRQs as you're reading and interpreting them. But very specifically, in FRQ1, question B is gonna be about identifying experimental procedures. This is gonna be something related to a variable or a control group. FRQ3, they're gonna show up again. Now, FRQ2 is also based an experiment. Mostly that one has to do with data interpretation and building your graph. And FRQ3 though, which is a shorter one, part B, you're going to again identify experimental procedures, so variable control, predicting results in part C. See, that's probably going to be that null hypothesis question if it shows up. And then D, either justifying a claim or a prediction from a particular experimental design. Question six, experiment stuff is going to come up again. It's going to show up a lot, but specifically in question six, uh, you'll have to interpret and work with data in parts A and B. And then part C, you're usually going to have to take the data from the experiment and say whether or not the hypothesis is supported or it could be rejected depending on what's happening in the experiment. Okay, I hope this has been helpful as a brief overview of experimental design, especially if you're refreshing for the AP Biology exam that's coming up. Be sure to check out the other life science and life lessons review resources I have on this channel. Thanks so much for watching. Give this video a like if it's been helpful, and I'll see you later.